All right, Sela. Today we're going to talk about the four types of hypersensitivity reactions. Each type has its own unique mechanism and clinical presentation. Let's dive in. Sounds great, Dr. Max. Where do we start? Let's begin with type 1 hypersensitivity. This type involves immunoglobulin E antibodies, so it is immunoglobulin E mediated. It is known as immediate hypersensitivity reactions or allergic reactions. First, Sela, I want you to know that type 1 hypersensitivity reaction is a body reaction to harmless substance. You must get this point. Normally, when the immune system encounters a substance, it determines whether it is harmful, such as a pathogen, or harmless. If the substance is a pathogen, the immune system responds in an appropriate way, either by immediate defense mechanisms like phagocytosis, or by a more specific response by activating T and B cells to target and eliminate this pathogen. In contrast, if the substance is harmless, but the immune system mistakenly identifies it as a threat, an allergic reaction may occur. This process begins with the initial exposure to the harmless material, known as allergen. In type 1, hypersensitivity we will talk about allergens that are commonly recognized by immunoglobulin E antibodies like pollen or certain foods, or even toxins released from parasites. These allergens commonly dissolve in the blood and penetrate tissues. When it enters the body, it is picked up by antigen-presenting cells, primarily dendritic cells. These dendritic cells process the allergen and present it on their surface in conjunction with major histocompatibility complex class II molecules. The dendritic cells migrate to the lymph nodes, where they present the allergen major histocompatibility complex to naive T-helper cells activates it, to differentiate into T-helper II cells. T-helper 2 cells secrete cytokines, such as interleukin-4, interleukin-5, and interleukin-13, which promote the activation of B-cells. Activated B-cells undergo class switching and differentiate into plasma cells that produce allergen-specific IgE antibodies. The immunoglobulin E binds to basophils and mast cells sensitizing them to the allergen. When the body exposed to the same antigen again, these cells, I mean basophils and mast cells, release histamine and other mediators. This leads to immediate symptoms like hives, swelling, bronchospasm, anaphylaxis, itching, and low blood pressure, usually within minutes to hours. You might also see an increase in eosinophils in the blood. So, type 1 reactions are quick, immediate, and involve immunoglobulin E and histamine release. Got it. What's next? Next is type 2 hypersensitivity, also known as cytotoxic hypersensitivity reactions. It occur when the immune system mistakenly targets and destroys the body's own cells, tissues, or organs. The antigens involved in type 2 hypersensitivity are typically located on the surface of cells or extracellular matrix components and are usually endogenous, meaning they are normally present on the body's cells. However, exogenous antigens such as certain drugs, that bind to cell membranes, can also trigger this reaction. These antigens, notice that in this type of hypersensitivity, I said antigen not allergen as in type 1 reaction, these antigen activate B cells either directly or through antigen presenting cells. The activated B cells differentiate into plasma cells, which are specialized for antibody production. Plasma cells produce specific antibodies, Immunoglobulin M is produced first, followed by class switching to immunoglobulin G in response to signals from T helper cells and cytokines. Immunoglobulin M and immunoglobulin G bind to the antigens on the surface of the targeted cells, forming antigen antibody complexes. The formation of this complex activates the complement system. Complement activation leads to the formation of the membrane attack complex, which creates pores in the cell membrane resulting in cell lysis and death. The antigen-antibody complexes can also opsonize the cells, marking them for phagocytosis by macrophages and neutrophils. Hence the name of this reaction is 
cytotoxic reaction. This destruction results in conditions like hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, and leukopenia. You know, Sela, the best example to explain this type of reaction is the reaction associated with mismatched blood transfusions. When an individual receives blood of an incompatible type, antibodies against the donor red blood cells lead to their destruction. It also seen in hemolytic anemia, myasthenia gravis, Graves' disease, and other disorders, but the idea is the same. Immunoglobulin G and immunoglobulin M antibodies target antigens on the body's own cells or tissues, leading to their destruction. Wow! So, type 1 hypersensitivity reactions occurs in response to soluble allergens and led to allergic reaction. While type 2 reaction involves antigens that are typically located on the surface of cells and led to cell destruction, right? Exactly, Sela. Now let's move on to type 3 hypersensitivity. Type 3 hypersensitivity reactions, also known as immune complex mediated hypersensitivity, occur when immune complexes, that are aggregates of antigens and antibodies, are formed in the bloodstream and then deposited in various tissues, leading to inflammation and tissue damage. The antigens involved in type 3 hypersensitivity are typically soluble and can be exogenous, such as microbial antigens, or endogenous, such as self-antigens and autoimmune diseases. B cells recognize these soluble antigens, leading to their activation and differentiation into plasma cells. Plasma cells produce antibodies, usually immunoglobulin G or immunoglobulin M antibodies, that bind to the soluble antigens in the bloodstream, forming immune complexes. The immune complexes circulate in the bloodstream. Due to various factors, such as size and charge of the complexes, and the state of the endothelium, these immune complexes are deposited in tissues, especially where blood filtration occurs, such as the kidneys, joints, and blood vessel walls. The deposited immune complexes activate the complement system, a group of proteins that enhances the ability of antibodies and phagocytic cells to clear pathogens and damaged cells. This process involves T helper 1 and T helper 17 cells, which secrete cytokines like interferon gamma and interleukin-17, promoting a distinct type of immune response. Note that type 3 reaction also involves the formation of antigen-antibody complexes and is mediated by immunoglobulin M and immunoglobulin G antibodies, and activate complement system and lead to cell destruction exactly like type 2 reaction. But wait, there is a main difference here. Type 2 reactions, complexes form on the surface of cells or tissues, leading to direct cell damage or destruction, while in type 3 reactions, involve soluble antigens found in the bloodstream, complexes form in the bloodstream and are deposited in tissues, causing inflammation and tissue damage due to immune complex deposition. Wait, wait, wait! Soluble antigens induce type 1 reactions. What does type 3 reaction have to do with soluble antigens? I'm confused now. Good observation, Sela. We must remove your confusion. The type of hypersensitivity reaction and the antibody produced in response to a soluble antigen depend on several factors, including the nature of the antigen, the context of the immune response, and the cytokine environment. Antigens that induce immunoglobulin E production are typically proteins or glycoproteins that are small, highly soluble, and stable, often with the ability to cross mucosal barriers. Common examples include pollen, dust mite proteins, certain food proteins, and insect venom. They are often encountered at mucosal surfaces, respiratory, gastrointestinal, and processed by local dendritic cells. This favors a T helper 2 response. Antigens that induce immunoglobulin G or immunoglobulin M production can be microbial proteins, self antigens in autoimmune diseases, or foreign proteins from drugs or vaccines. These antigens are often encountered in the context of infections or chronic inflammation. Antigens may enter the bloodstream through infections, vaccinations, or chronic diseases, favoring a T helper 1 and T helper 17 response. Ah, I think I understand now. So, you're saying that regardless of whether the antigen is soluble, the type of hypersensitivity reaction is determined by the nature of the antigen, the route of exposure, and the specific T-cell response it triggers? Yes, you've captured the different factors that can directing these different immune responses. 
Type 3 reaction occur, for example, in systemic lupus erythematosus. Autoantibodies form immune complexes with nuclear antigens, leading to deposition in various tissues and organs, causing inflammation and damage, especially in the kidneys. And another example is post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Immune complexes formed in response to streptococcal antigens are deposited in the glomeruli of the kidneys, causing inflammation and impaired kidney function. Type 4. Hypersensitivity reactions, also known as delayed type hypersensitivity reactions, are cell-mediated immune responses that typically occur 48 to 72 hours after exposure to the antigen and peak around 72-96 hours. While the initial reaction may resolve within a few days, chronic exposure or persistent antigens can lead to prolonged reactions lasting weeks, months, or even years. Unlike other types of hypersensitivity reactions, type 4 reactions do not involve antibodies, but are instead mediated by T cells. The antigens involved in type 4 hypersensitivity can be exogenous, such as microbial antigens, environmental antigens, or endogenous, self-antigens in autoimmune diseases. Dendritic cells or macrophages process these antigens and present them on their surface using major histocompatibility complex class II molecules. During the first exposure to the antigen, naive T cells recognize the antigen, major histocompatibility complex on antigen-presenting cells. These naive T cells differentiate into specific subtypes, mainly T helper 1 cells, and to a lesser extent, T helper 17 cells, depending on the cytokine environment. Some of these activated T cells become memory T cells, which remain in the body and can respond more rapidly upon subsequent exposures. Upon subsequent exposure to the same antigen, the memory T cells quickly recognize the antigen major histocompatibility complex presented by antigen presenting cells. Activated T helper 1 cells release pro inflammatory cytokines such as interferon gamma tumor necrosis factor alpha, and interleukin-2. These cytokines attract and activate macrophages and other immune cells to the site of antigen exposure. The recruited macrophages become highly activated and release lysosomal enzymes, reactive oxygen species, and nitric oxide, contributing to tissue damage and inflammation. In chronic cases, persistent antigen presence can lead to the formation of granulomas, which are organized collections of macrophages, T cells, and other immune cells, attempting to contain the antigen. Examples of type 4 hypersensitivity are tuberculin skin test, known as MANTU test, in which injection of purified protein derivative from mycobacterium tuberculosis elicits a local delayed type hypersensitivity response in individuals previously sensitized to the antigen, causing a palpable induration at the injection site. Another example is chronic infections like tuberculosis and leprosy. The persistent infection with intracellular pathogens, like mycobacterium tuberculosis, leads to continuous T-cell activation and chronic inflammation, often resulting in granuloma formation. Lymphocytosis is common in type 4 reactions due to the involvement of T-cells. You might also see leukocytosis, but usually eosinophils is normal. So, type 4 is all about T-cells and a delayed response. Exactly, exactly, Sela. Each type of hypersensitivity reaction has its own unique mechanism and presentation, and CBC results can help provide clues, but they are not definitive. It's important to look at the specific immune cells involved and their counts to differentiate between them. Thank you, Dr. Max. This was really helpful and interesting. Anytime, Sela. Understanding these mechanisms helps us better diagnose and treat allergic and immune reactions. And for everyone watching, if you found this explanation helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe to the Infection Tube for more informative videos.